All right, okay, so here's a sobering thought. Humans weren't built for space. I mean, you probably say there are a lot of places humans weren't built for right here on Earth, right? And yet there we are. But this is space we're talking about. It's dark, it's unimaginably cold. You've got to contend with extreme levels of radiation. There's zero gravity or even microgravity that could literally turn your muscles into mush in under a year. And then there's air, that little thing that we breathe, oxygen. Yeah, not in space. But what if there were a workaround to all of this, a brilliant hack to ensure humanity's progress and presence across the stars, across the universe? What if humanoid robots like Tesla's Optimus robot could do all the hard work for us, laying the ground, building all the stuff we need, just getting things ready before we actually get there as human astronauts? Well, here to discuss this with me today is Dr. Scott Walter. He's a mechanical and aerospace engineer, a robot offline programming pioneer, and a factory simulation expert. Welcome, Dr. Walter. It's great to have you on the Over the Horizon podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, Roy, and thank you for inviting me. It's not as if this is a completely new concept, right? I mean, the rovers on the moon that we've had and on Mars, they're essentially highly specialized robots. And we have a few of them out there. Right? But we also have had robots working side by side with astronauts on the International Space Station, right? You're talking about Sphere, that, the, the, the Sphere which was a pioneer, and now the Astro B robot. So it's, there is a, a serious economic and safety case to be made for robots to precede humans on the moon and Mars, don't you think? Yes, yeah, there always has been. And so uh, it depends upon your definition of a robot. A lot of times when someone talks about robots or when I say them robotics, they're always thinking of something like out of Star Wars, like C-3PO and everything. And they tell them, well, that's not quite like the robots that I work with, yeah. but that is changing. So we've had robots out there, just not humanoid robots. Yeah. And we've had, you know, the, the Voyager um, satellite, a space probe, was considered a robotic instrument. Now, it doesn't look like a robot to me in, in any way. It has a lot of automations. It's got cameras on it. It's able to, you know, obviously, you know, uh, position itself and do the flybys and everything. It needs to do a little bit of exploration. Certainly what we've seen on Mars already with the rovers that are on there are a bit yeah. closer to what we think of a robot because they're very mobile, able to move around. I even do have an arm on there that's able to do some sort of experiments, but that's still right. not quite the humanoid and very specialized. So it's not like they're meant for being able to do the kind of tasks that people can do. They are yeah. assistants and they're able to do other things. And of course, probably the most yeah. famous arm, robotic yeah. arm that we know of is the Canadian arm, which was on the space Canada shuttle. Arm. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that and that was for payload, uh, payload retrieval and deployment, and later on to be able to do inspection around there. So there were certain tasks it could do. It could help astronauts on their spacewalks. So yeah. sometimes it was used like a almost like a cherry picker to be able to take the astronaut and move them to a safe location where they could then do the actual task that was at hand. Um, yeah. But now this is the first time we're really talking about can we come up with a robot that will be able to replace what astronauts are doing right now? Can we reduce the number of EVAs to be able to allow us to yeah set up habitats in very, very extreme conditions? Yeah. I mean, you say very extreme conditions. There's a lot of learnings to be had from the rovers, right? It's not mm -hmm. as if we're starting on a, on a completely blank slate. There's a lot that we've already learned and, uh, and that we can apply to a humanoid robot. Yes, and, and we must. We, we, first, we have to know a lot about what are the conditions we're going to be in. Hmm. And, um, and because we have to test way in advance to be able to make sure whatever we send out there is going to be able to survive in those conditions. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've got a couple of choices when, when we go to Mars or we go to the moon. We can try to bring some sort of habitat with us, which is going to be very small and limited. And so it'll be like living out of a, a small recreational vehicle, mm -hmm. you know, several million miles from home. And that will be kind of exciting for a while, but no, yeah, if you, you want something a little fast. bit bigger. So, so yeah. how do you expand that? And 
you're yeah. going to have to do something locally. You're going to have to do like, you know, in situ resource utilization to be able to build something. Yeah. And then there's those other problems that, you know, first lack of air, which is one problem, yeah. Yeah. lack of heat, which is another problem there. And then we have to worry about the radiation. And yeah. if we want to make something big, it's going to be really expensive and almost impossible to bring it there with us. So we're going to have to come yeah. up with something. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've seen that uh, using the regolith that's there is one solution for a lot of these things that will allow us to make these habitats to grow. But that is a construction project. And you go around anywhere, look at any construction project, those buildings don't build themselves. Yeah. And even with all the heavy equipment we have, you know, with excavators and everything else and power tools, there's still a humanoid form that's sort of needed to be able yeah. to get everything to work. So yeah. it's going to be really difficult to come up with some very simple piece of equipment that will build this whole thing without there being something to come along and service and maintain and verify that everything's working. Yeah. Typically that's the role of an astronaut, but yeah. why couldn't it be also the role of some sort of optimus um, astrobot? The astronaut? next best thing to a human really. Yes, yes, yes. And in many cases, you know, when, when we're used to having something break down, you know, if we're driving down the highway, we get a problem, we pull a car where we can get out and we can debug it and fix it, you know, we'll open up yeah. the hood and go in there and find something yeah. or if we have to change a spare tire, that's yeah. that's fairly easy to do. But if we are out in space and there's a problem outside the vehicle, that means a spacewalk. And sometimes yeah. it's a simple thing. Um, yeah. I was I, I was recently listening to um, the Apollo 16 mission and what was going on there. And I was surprised how many times during the Apollo 16 mission they should have aborted and gone home. And yeah. it's amazing that the, the NASA at that day was, was not as risk averse as today. And there were some simple things like they, yeah. when they were getting ready to, um, to undock, to go down to the lunar surface, first they had gone through a six hour delay because of, of a problem with the service module. They, they were able to sort of say, ah, oh, we'll get around it. But now they needed to get new data because they were six hours behind. And yeah. then they had to open up this simple antenna, this S-band antenna. And it wouldn't pop open because like a mechanical latch was stuck. So it's yeah. like, oh, I mean, does that mean the whole thing is aborted? And the only way they could have done it is to go out and do a spacewalk. And that would have just said at that point, right. the consumables and everything are gone. It's just something simple to go out and be able to poke that thing just to open it up. The workaround was literally to like vocally say, these are what the numbers are. You have to enter into the computer as opposed to someone yeah. pushing a button in mission control and going up there. And it was all, all analog. And unfortunately, at that point, the computers were so simple, you didn't need a whole lot yeah. of data, right? You yeah. know, nowadays, it's like, oh, we're going to send you a gigabyte file. It's like, you're not typing that thing. And it was turned out to be like 18 numbers. So it was it was fairly easy. But it yeah. shows that sometimes there's something simple like that. And you need something to just be able to go out there that's kind of an all-purpose thing to maybe fix that thing. And that right. would have been the perfect case. It was like, well, just imagine if we could have just had some airlock or something like that. Well, we already had one of these human robots. Just go out there and just like unfold that thing for us and then come back yeah. on in. And so we know simple things like that happen. You can imagine it's going to happen in a construction project anywhere you're going along. Yeah. You need something yeah. to go out there and be able to tap something with a hammer when it's necessary, hold something in yeah. place, look around and inspect, find out what's going on, and then be able to figure out what the solution is going to be. Yeah. I mean, like, Probably, I mean, by order of magnitudes higher. I mean, if Carl Murphy's law, if, if if something can go wrong, it will. And when you apply that to mm -hmm. space, it's probably orders of magnitude far mm -hmm. higher, which which yeah. makes it so much more dangerous. And then when you when you have a mishap, um, the sort of the public scrutiny that uh, space programs go to, that governments go through. Um, they tend to become a, a, a huge hindrance, a huge hurdle to then go to the next mission. Right. But if you have expendable humanoid robots to do that, it's just it's just a bunch of metal and a few circuits that's gone. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, it has a cost, cost associated with it, but you can't compare uh, compare it to a human life. Correct. Yeah. So, so, so that's another aspect, the safety aspect of getting human humanoid robots out there first. Um, you're, you have a background uh, in in factory simulation. How? I mean, can you can you talk us through what it what it means and what the challenges are to kind of anticipate the challenges of constructing infrastructure on the moon? 
and the challenge of trying to replicate the environment to do that here on Earth and validate your experiments. Yes. Something as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the background I have in factory automation is someone's got an idea of how they want to lay out a factory, and they're pretty sure it's going to work. And rather than building the whole thing and finding out, oops, there's a couple of things we didn't consider, you go ahead yeah. and simulate it. So you create a virtual world and you go through it. And a lot of times things that you thought you thought all the way through, you begin to realize when you do the simulation, oh, wow, we hadn't thought of that or look at that particular problem. So they come up yeah. earlier rather than later. And, and that's what you want to do is you, you want to find out all those flaws ahead of time. The same thing in the mission planning is there's so much that you want to know in, in advance of what could go wrong. And of course, the only problem is like there's the, you know, the, the unknown unknowns. We don't know what we don't know. Exactly. And that's just going to crop up. So you need to be flexible. Yeah. The, the more of those we can get out of the way. So we know it's going to be very harsh. So the temperature environment is going to be something else. We're going to be on the, the moon is probably worse than Mars because it gets very, very hot and it gets very, very yeah. cold. Yeah. Um, in both cases. It, it gets as high as 126 degrees Celsius. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. I believe I was, about 173 minus below. Um, yes. In, in mm -hmm. the depths of those craters. So that's. It's, it's, right. it's just impossible to wrap your head around these, these temperatures. Yes. And, and, and it was so cold. I mean, think about that. That's the reason why the Chandrayaan um, yeah. uh, probe was not able to come back after two weeks because yeah. it was so extremely cold, it could not survive it. And you might say, well, why couldn't it survive it? And it's because you've got different materials with different expansion rates. Yeah. And it got so cold, things became brittle and started fracturing because of that. So in order to be able to survive those cold, cold nights, you would have to completely redesign your circuit boards to be able to, to do these temperature swings. You, you could probably design yeah. them for extremely cold temperatures and design yeah. them for extremely warm. But the fact that you've got to go between them, that's, that's another big challenge. The only other way is that you would just need to keep them warm, which is what they do in a lot of other probes that are out there is they're constantly having to keep them heated up. So it's not just your electronics, but your batteries as well. Is yeah. if your batteries get too cold, they're not going to work very well or or respond for you. So there's some pretty big challenges, which you know they've been able to solve in a variety of ways. Some of which are pretty expensive because the space program you can do whatever and wouldn't yeah. be practical down here on Earth, but um, may have to be implemented in in some of those changes. Probably would have to go into like an Optimus spot because I don't think the batteries that are currently in the Optimus spot would work up there. You would you would probably have to make modifications to be able to to deal with the kind of temperature extremes that you're going to be looking at. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I find it difficult to imagine all of this without the private sector. Can you imagine all of this if if it was just up to NASA or the European Space Agency or ISRO or the Chinese? Well, I guess the Chinese would have done a I don't know a better job, but they would have certainly pumped in a lot more money and taken a lot more risk. Yeah. And I think which, you know, the private sector is very important. I think what's also important is to kind of turn things around. It used to be that we, we put things in space because that's how we had to design the thing to get it to work in space. And then we thought about, well, what kind of applications can we have down here on earth? And they came kind of later on. Certainly there were a lot of benefits to the, the what we learned in the Apollo program and everything else. But now we're kind of turning it around. It's, it's not like we're necessarily building the Optimus bots or the humanoid bots for being used in space. Yeah. They've already got a practical use down here on earth. So there's yeah. an economic and a business case for them. So you yeah. can do that development. And of course the bots that we're seeing be developed for use here on earth are not going to be the same bots that are going out there. There's going to be enough sure. similarities and overlap. They're going to have to be changed yeah. a bit, but the yeah. learnings that we have to do to get them to work, yeah. to be able yeah. to work autonomously, which is the key, yeah. uh, we'll be able to get them in and there'll be huge benefits. So it, it's yeah. a kind of a research program that pays for itself as opposed to one of these, oh, we'll throw right. $24 billion in here, and then maybe three or four decades from now, we'll see the benefits coming back. No, we've yeah. got to flip that script. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, yeah. there's no way you could finance this. Yeah, and that, that's really been one of the hallmarks of the private sector um, in new space, really, um, the quick turnaround times. And, you know, um, I mean, even when it comes to the minimum viable product, it has to be able to generate revenue. And it has yes. there has to be a revenue, um, you know, justification for additional money to be pumped into that, or else it's just dead, dead in the water. Yes. But it's but it's interesting these contracts that that NASA is being uh, uh, handing out, and uh, and Icon is one of them. 
they've uh, just recently um, been doing a lot of work. There's been a lot of forward movement on their contract uh, with NASA to develop um, essentially infrastructure on the moon using lunar regolith. Uh, there's been a lot of excitement around the fact that um, you know the uh, Indian uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization Chandrayaan-3 mission, detected uh, sulfur in sufficient quantities on the moon, which then could be used for um, to build what is called lunarcrete, the lunar mm -hmm. equivalent of concrete. So, uh, what do you what do you make of that, and and what do you make of these contracts, and and where does a humanoid robot like Optimus fit into this, into the larger scheme of things when it comes to infrastructure development on the moon, like building simple things like a landing pad mm -hmm. or a road connecting landing pads. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be important because it's always difficult to have any sort of fully autonomous equipment that you might design to automatically build a road or do something else for you without requiring a certain amount of maintenance or setup. Hmm. Um, and you want to have those humanoid bots there because they are what makes sure the mission doesn't fail because something got stuck. So they're able to go out there and, and make sure that that's um, able to continue on as well as there'll probably be certain tasks that are just, they're too difficult to automate, you know, in the normal way with something special and that it makes more sense to have a human there. And it could be as simple as dealing with consumables, um, simple maintenance on it that has to be done on a daily basis, uh, loading or unloading uh, different things. And the fact that um, all these resources are going to be coming from somewhere and you're going to constantly have to be setting things up and moving them somewhere else and then doing it again and again and again. And it yeah. seems like you would need to have some sort of humanoid bot there. Now, whether that's yeah. done completely remote control from Earth or is it done in concert with astronauts that are actually there, in which case they act more as the managers or the foremen of the project, knowing that they have these other bots that are able to take over some of these specially, special tasks and literally do the, the heavy lifting for them. So do you, do you envision humans going with humanoid robots and kind of uh, overseeing for, a, for, a, for maybe a three month period and then coming back? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's good. It, it'll depend on the mission. I, I would think that because it's only a three day trip to the moon and back, uh, they would probably accompany the bots there and then the bots could help them doing the, the setting up. So it's not like we can suddenly send a hundred astronauts to the moon to work on some project. But if we could yeah. send a hundred bots and that will be really easy because, uh, let me see. Um, I think the, the Apollo, um, space suit weighed about once you had everything about 350 pounds. So, and that was with, um, you know, totally also including the astronaut. So that's just that amount of mass you've got to send up there for yeah. one person yeah. where, one person. so you can send about two and a half bots for, for that mass. And then remember the yeah. consumables that the human has to have, you're going to have all these yeah. other things that yeah. kind of go on there. So, exactly. and yeah. you, you know, humans need a little bit of space to move around where you can just like stack a bunch of spots. So you can get a lot of them down yeah. there really quickly. And I would think in the beginning, because it's so easy to get people there and back and forth, you might want to have them work there because eh, if the bot gets stuck and the bots can't figure out how to unstick stick themselves, like maybe the human can. So eventually once right. you get that learning curve, uh, when you go to Mars, now it's a good question see, would they accompany them to Mars? Would it be a skeleton crew that we kind of send there to work with them? Or do we just send the bots out there at first? It's just like, just set that campsite up for us. So we get down there we're glamping right away and, you know, not having to worry about all this other stuff. So, I mean, that, <laughs> that's just a close send Captain call America. As well. Just, just send Captain America. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, it, it'll probably do something like that. And then the other question is that as we we've seen from the, um, the, the Rover that the Chandrayaan, um, mission had is it was, I guess, had some telerobotic control and that's yeah. because you've got, I think the best you can do is about a three second delay because it's one and a half seconds back yeah. and forth to the moon, assuming there's right. no other delays going on in there. And right. eh, that's kind of manageable from that distance. But Mars, you know, under the best case, it's like four minutes one way. So you're talking about like eight minutes back and forth. And then other times, depending upon where they are, it could be 20 minutes in one direction. So like 40 minutes, I mean, talk about playing a game with a lot of, a lot of lag and latency in there. 
That, so it's going to have to be autonomous at some point. We, yeah. we, we can't continue yeah. to, to do that. The only yeah. way you could kind of do it telerobotically, mm-hmm. and um, I w- was working with um, some researchers at the University of Michigan back in the 80s that were looking at some telerobotic applications in space, and they were well aware of the lag and, and wanting to have robots that would just be in low Earth orbit and figure out how to deal with what would end up being like a second and a half or two seconds by the time everything kind of bounces around. And they were thinking that if you just had like a virtual world that you saw overlaying where the robot is, and you would be controlling it kind of that virtual world and then getting the commands and then maybe getting updated because you sort of know the environment. And you could do the same thing if you got a really good map. And the question is, how good is your map? So if you get a really good map, you could do some things like driving your rovers around where they want to be ahead of time without any surprises. Uh, Okay, that you can do on a three second delay to the moon. But when you're talking about Mars, it's not quite that way. It, you'd only want to do it and say, we've got a really good map and we're going to come up with this route, which I f- have a feeling they're probably already doing something like this at JPL. This is where we want it to go. Just give it the commands, go ahead and do it. And then as it executes it, of course, it's going to use a certain amount of autonomy to say, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, yeah. The map you had wasn't so good. There's a little bit of a crater here. We've got to watch out for a pothole um, that wasn't showing up that we're, we know we're going to have to avoid or, or some sort of obstacles. Yeah, because, I mean, it's not as if the lunar surface or the surface of Mars is static. It's changing all the time. It is changing. Yeah, and, I mean, if you have dust storms on the Mars that can literally change change where your dunes are uh, in a matter of hours, it's... Yes. It's like like the question of LiDAR and mapping for autonomous uh, autonomous, uh, cars, you know? What do you do when there's a change, when there's a traffic cone out of place so it's, it's construction yeah it's, it's not changing as much but the thing is like it, it's kind of the heisenberg uncertainty principle as soon as you land something there you've changed the landscape right <laughs> you know right. already right. so no matter how yeah. good those orbital maps were you know yeah. right around your vicinity something just changed there and it may not be exactly what you you were hoping it would be so you would right. have to update those maps constantly and of course we're right. going to be changing the surface um things are going to be going around once you have a lot of that activity and you have to be able to yeah. deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's talk about um, the question of how do you ad- adapt? How do you modify um, humanoid robots as we know them on earth to the moon? What, what do you need to do um, in order to get uh, these robots to work in, in like gravity? That's one sixth that of earth and temperature ranges that are just crazy. And then you've got radiation exposure. And then you've got the question of, you know, 13 day, days and nights and, and all of the variances that take place on the moon. Let's forget Mars. Let's just look at the moon right now. How do you modify, let's say, Optimus, for example? How do you modify it to work at, work on the moon? Okay. So we'll, we'll take the first thing, the, the one six gravity. That should be pretty easy because you would probably make your motors actually a little bit smaller and they don't need to be as strong. You could probably make them like what you have right now, but the chances are you could actually size them down and that would then give you probably longer battery life because you do not need to have motors which are quite as powerful. So you'd be able to do that. And I'm pretty sure they can design it because if we go back to the the example of the Canadian arm that was on the shuttle, the Canadian arm that was on the shuttle could not lift itself uh, in, in Earth's gravity. So they, they actually had lanyards and everything else to be able to sort of test it out. So it was very slow moving. It was designed in zero G and it could yeah. only move itself around in that. And then there was the example of the Astro B, which, I mean, that, that thing is so cool because, yeah, you know, again, something you design, you can't test it until it gets up there. You can do all the things, work at your equations, but it just shows that you know, if you understand physics and the design, you can come up with something that works well. And it had to be thought out pretty well is, yeah. so this is, like a drone, except it doesn't yeah. need to produce any lift because it's zero G. Yeah. But it does produce a little bit of thrust to be able to move itself around in different directions. But you got to be careful of that in zero G because you know, this is even a problem with quadcopters. Quadcopters, they spin in opposite directions. The reason they do that is to have the torques cancel themselves out. So if right. you just have one fan that's spinning in one direction, then that whole thing is going to spin in the opposite direction in a zero G. So you, you need to actually have two motors in there that are rotating counter to each other to counter it out to be able to. So those are like the little things you get to think through. It's like, you've got to make sure you have like a really good sim 
of that yeah. and putting in there. And look at this thing. It is absolutely great. I mean, I'm surprised at how stable it is when it's out in a certain position in space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, assuming this is not like CGI or something like that. So I know, they right? really get the stability of that down. Yeah. And it shows that, you know, we know how to design these things for zero G, but it's tough to test. Again, yeah. Yeah. the uh, uh, the, the curiosity, um, there's a curiosity, you know, the, the, the quadcopter that we have on, on Mars right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not a quadcopter, it's a helicopter. It's a helicopter. Um, that they, you know, they did as much testing as you could do on Earth, but you had to go up there. So th they could test it in the same kind of atmosphere in, in a, that they have, but they, it was very difficult to test it with the same gravity. So you, they really didn't know if it was going to work till they got there. But they were pretty confident, as we can see, it was extremely yeah. successful. So yeah. um, these kind of bots will be designed, they can be lower power because they don't have to fight the effects of gravity. Hmm. There's like you said, there's a lot of other things they're going to have to fight. Yeah. Um, but radiation. But what, yeah. yeah. But what's what, you know, if you, if you talk about astrobe, what really fascinates me is the modularity of it and how you can change it. So just mm -hmm. one robot is built in a way that it can adapt to the needs of, of, um, of, of the mission. Yes. And that's, and that's something that could be done with, um, with Optimus. Oh yeah. 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 And, and, and a lot of it comes down to the tooling. So what makes a, a robot usable is not so much the robot itself, but is the end of arm tooling you put it on there. So suddenly whatever tools you're able to pick up now, some people might say, well, does that mean that Optimus changes its hands or its arms? Um, potentially it, it could be doing something like that. And then it becomes more like an industrial robot, which never doesn't really have a hand. It has a mounting plate that you then attach something onto it. And it's like, whoa, look, now I've got a gripper. So it's like I have a hand or like you snap right. on a weld gun. It's like, well, now I have a welding torch that's on me. So they may have things like that. Or they might just say, let's just use the tools that the astronauts are using as well. Make sure they're interswappable. So you, you would set it up that way. And it's a question of whether the bot has the intelligence to be able to deal with a variety of different tasks. And I think by the time we get to the moon, they will be smart enough to be able to do a lot of that. The question at yeah. that point is making it such that it's space hardened. So, you know, radiation hardening, hardening, which we already know how to do. Um, yeah. It might be rather interesting with the FSD chip. I wonder if it's space hardened <laughs> or they'd have to do to be able to do that. Cause usually, usually the chips that are space hardened are so far behind, you know, the modern kind of uh, processors that uh, you may have to come up with something a little bit different for that. Again, the batteries I'm concerned with because of the temperature ranges uh, that you'd be going through and whether right. you would go from, you know, how do you deal the extreme cold that you're going to have to the extreme heat? And mm. and you right now, the way Optimus is, is just using a fan and, and circulating air is enough because it's not producing that much heat. Not not like in a, in a Tesla where you have um, the, the heat pumps to, to do the cooling and everything else right. for that. You've got... In this case, they're just using air, but you don't have any air in the moon to do that. So now, yeah. do you need to have radiative cooling or, you know, what, what would be necessary? Are you actually going to see the Optimus robots have what will look like almost uh, wings on their back? You know, almost look like fairies, yeah. uh, with yeah. these, w which would be that potentially reminds me radiators. of Transformers, Optimus Prime. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. What, but at, at the same time, depending on where you're in, uh, uh, you know, I have a feeling that in some cases where you are in space, is there's no such thing as waste heat. <laughs> a lot of times I'm like, wow, yeah. we're, we're really going to yeah. need, the, need the heat. Yeah. But yeah. for the moon, yes, um, there's 14 days. That, I mean, that's when it's cold. I mean, I, I think yeah. when it's operating, it's always operating in warm conditions. I don't know that it's yeah. ever really w working in cold conditions unless you've decided, oh, we need those 14 days to finish this construction project. Let's bring out some lights and stuff like that and, and power it up so it can do it. So it might be working in some cold conditions. I would think what you would do is that if you have a base that's near the South Pole, yeah, and then you just get some kind of ring city around there, and you just keep on moving depending upon where the sun is. <laughs> so, rather than just saying it's 14 days of hibernation, just like move to the the, the far side right now and work there yeah. for two weeks and then come back. So you might make it deployable that way of having to move around and then not worry about the extreme cold. But the yeah. extreme but I guess, temperatures I guess. also could be a problem with joints. That's something I'm worried about. Right, right. But I, I guess that's that's something any humanoid robot would have to deal with because uh, yes. NASA has has intentions of tapping uh, 
uh, water trapped in the South Pole where it's perpetually dark, extremely cold. Uh, and uh, they've also gone out and uh, signed a contract for a, a, an oxygen pipeline out of, out of the South Pole. So these are very real um, infrastructure plans or infrastructure program plans that NASA does have. And I guess it's essential. I mean, you'll need water, you'll need hydrogen, you need oxygen for various purposes. And uh, it's so far, it looks like that it's, the maximum distribution is at the poles. Yes. So this is something that any robot would have to contend with. Yeah. And, and for an infrastructure project like this, the, again, the question is, can you create some sort of autonomous pipeline mechanism that would be able to work flawlessly? Or is it something that always has to work in concert with some sort of humanoid form to help it out? And certainly when I think of all the construction projects here on earth that have these yeah. pipelines, yes, they have some, you know, amazing pieces of equipment to help out. But there's always people nearby operating those things. Yeah, always supervised human supervision is, yes. is yes. at least here on Earth. But what about modularity? We've, we've, we've talked about modularity in robots. What about modularity in in construction? And what sort of a, of an effect would that have? Oh, I think that, that, that habitats, you know, three D printers. The, the more modularity you can get, the the better. So in many cases, you might have a, a similar kind of platform, which may be the, the mobile platform. And then it's like whatever you've got to build on top of it. So uh, a lot of people may have seen that, you know, there are these small tractors you can get that you can, can put any sort of attachments on it to do whatever you need to do. So it can be um, uh, it can be a, a digger or you can put a, a, a normal plow on it to push things off. You can... Uh, you know, a whole variety of different things for being able to go out and cut trees and all, but the, the yeah. basic platform is the same. So again, it's like any kind of robot would, uh, what makes a robot a certain type of robot is the end of arm tooling is not necessarily the design of the arm itself. So they, they're designed to have these things that are replaceable, um, yeah. to maybe to allow you to do a particular task. And I think that would be very important is, is it, and, you know, in some cases, you might say, we're doing this particular application and, and get the most optimization out, or we're just going to completely design everything from the ground up because that's what we want to do for that thing. But you don't have that luxury in space where you could just send, yeah. you know, all these different items out there to do this one unique task. It's like, no, we've got so many. We need to have a common platform and just be able to, like, say, modularity, swap these things out to be able to make yeah. a different configuration out of it. And that's going to be key. Yeah, that takes us back to the question of how much can you anticipate here on Earth? Mm -hmm. You know, and how, oh, how and, much and, can and, you get, away, yeah. get out of the way? And, and, and we can do, we can probably, there'll probably be a lot of benefits to us doing that here on Earth as well, is realizing yeah, sure. that, you know, this, the same platform could be used for something else rather than, I mean, yeah. sometimes when I look around Processes that, can be optimized and, right. and, and made simpler. Yes, Plus they can be. thinking. Yes, and, and if you think about it, you know, a lot of people will have more, more cars than there are people in the house. It's like, oh, well, because, you know, we need this thing for when the family goes off on a trip somewhere, you know, take the kids right. to a soccer game. And we need this right. other, I need the pickup to be able to, to go and get these supplies so I could do gardening or something like that. And wouldn't it just be nice if you could just reconfigure it for whatever you want so you just have that one vehicle. But no, we decided yeah. we have multiple ones. So yeah. that is the thing. Modularity is going to be very important. And do you, yeah. you think we could lobby Elon to build a, a transformer Tesla? Oh yeah, that would be nice. That that would absolutely be nice. Yeah, push a button suddenly, whoop, yeah, it becomes something a little bit different, different size, stretches out yeah, eventually. Um, yeah, I, I I would definitely like to see to, to see us have more. You know, they, they were already back in the '80s. These examples of of almost like a skateboard design, where they had, that, that was your basic car, and it was like a matchbox or something like that, or that you know you just kind of take the whatever the top off the chassis and then you could put something else on there and the, the base yeah. was the same. So you could have right. a camping vehicle. You could have a smaller vehicle for moving around sports car if you wanted for the weekend. Yeah. And that would be cool. Yeah. That would absolutely be cool. <laughs> okay. So we've, we've, we've talked about temperature variance, radiation. We've talked about um, gravity. What about lunar dust uh -huh. and yeah. Martian dust, which can be really, really abrasive. Very. Um, so you 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 spoke about your concern about the joints. Um, dust is a huge uh, problem for that, but also because of the gravity, everything that you do kicks up a cloud of dust. Just imagine a starship landing on the moon, 
I just it's crazy the amount of dust it could kick up. I mean, we we just we saw some of that with the Chandrayaan three when there was a mm-hmm. I think a, a short hop, and the amount of dust that that uh, it kicked up with just a short burst of its rockets. Just imagine what will happen with the Starship, or or just any construction activity on the moon. Yes, um, yeah, anything is going to uh, certainly the landing is going to kick up a lot of dust, and the question is, you know, how far is that dust storm going to be felt? Uh, and it's going to be pretty far away. I mean, potentially these things could almost, you know, just orbit back around the, the moon before they, they actually right. settle out. So it could take a while. So there's a lot of concerns in being able to mitigate that to make sure you don't have so much. Um, hopefully the, the biggest is just going to be the landing. And then once we have some pads, uh, that won't happen anymore. You're going to be kicking some stuff up in your construction projects, but uh, hopefully you're not like blasting rock or doing anything like that. So, so most of that I think would be fairly localized, but that is nasty, nasty stuff. Um, and it might be a little bit worse on the moon because the, the moon doesn't have uh, the same process for erosions that you, at least you do have on Mars with the right. dust storms. So I think the Martian dust is probably not quite as coarse. It may be smoothed out a little bit over the millennia that it's been more than millennia, you know, the eras yeah, that it's gone yeah, through yeah. being blown around. Whereas the, yeah. the, the, uh, the regolith is, is very abrasive. So this, so this is going to be a challenge for the design of the arm. So, I mean, you have any sort of mechanical joint, there's going to be some sort of limits that it works in and you need some sort of lubrication. So the, the lubricants are going to have to be very special to be able to make sure they can handle different temperatures and, um, need to be sealed against a vacuum as well as um you know having the regolith get into these joints so they, they cannot be exposed and if, if you know if we look at the optimus model there's a lot of joints that are exposed right there now in, in all all the robots so you need to find out some way to be able to make sure they're hermetically sealed and also when you go to the temperature variations that you're going to have expansion and contraction which means right. in some temperatures your joints might be very loose and other temperatures, they might bind up so much that they don't function anymore. So you would need to have some sort of heating in there. So you'd have to figure out how to counter that and whether you do it through heaters or you just come up with some clever way of designing those joints that the thermal expansion does not become a problem. Um, but my biggest concern is you know, just the dust getting in there and making sure you keep it out. And is it going to be as easy as putting covers over everything? Um, uh, that that maybe not be enough. So I, I would think, you know, just having some sort of fabric cover will be one line of defense. But I think you're going to need to have some other uh, more aggressive sort of mechanical solutions around there, covering up the you know the elbow is like one area, the wrist is another area that are seriously exposed. The shoulder is not so bad right now, but you know you still get a few places that you start getting some grit in there. It's not going to be uh, be pretty good for the bot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, what's the first base? Is it the Starship itself? I mean, it's got a, a capacity of a payload of, I think, over 100 tons easily. Yes. That's a lot of space. The, so, the Starship become the initial base? I, I think so. I mean, it's a, <clears throat> it's a question of whether they think that's a, a really expensive base because it's, it's something that can be used. I would think eventually, um, when you decide that they've passed their service life, that you're going to go ahead and say, yeah, we'll start using them as parts of the bases. Or it may be that right away, you're just saying like, it's it's just so effective before we can get something set up. Yeah, it's going to be there. And maybe it's kind of a temporary base. So you say, okay, we'll put it down there and we'll let it stay there for you know six months or a year, whatever it takes for us to build out the infrastructure that we need. Mm-hmm. And once that's ready, uh, we can return. Now, it also depends upon how much you're bringing down to to the moon and whether you have enough fuel to be able to go back to return. Hmm. So you might decide that on the first trip, we want to bring a lot down, so much down we don't have enough fuel to go back. But part of the mission to go down there is to figure out how to create the fuel that we're going to need for the return journey. Or maybe that comes yeah. with later starships that come along that either bring the, the you know the fuel you would need to return or the equipment yeah. to be able to do it. Because so I, 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 Elon's talked a lot about uh, refuelers in space and having them parked in an orbit. It could very uh, around Earth that could very easily be replicated around the moon. Yes, yes, it could, and I, I and think what course, you would 
I guess I guess it would be. I mean, given given once the gravity on Moon being one sixth that of Earth, it would be you'd use consume a lot less fuel in in blasting off from the Moon surface yes. than on Earth. Yes, a, a lot less. So if you can start to create the fuel on the Moon, it would make more sense to send up to the the, the gateway. So rather Locked than trying to, to bring it up from the Earth, it, it might even be more efficient if you're able to produce it on the Moon to then send it back to Leo, rather than bring it up to Leo for any sort of missions that you have there. Yeah. So potentially yeah. the Moon could be your gas station. The question is, we don't yeah. know that it can because we can't do the the Sabatier process on the Moon like we can on Mars because we don't have you know CO two atmosphere there to draw right. from. It right. seems that we will be able to produce you know oxygen and hydrogen from yeah. the, the ices that are there but right. ironically the moon is really it's it's carbon depleted there's not a whole lot of carbon yeah. there so if you want to make methane that, that's going to be very difficult right. and i think it's part of the reason why blue origin has decided you know for their lander um is going to be using just hydrogen because that yeah. means you can actually produce the fuel on uh on the surface of, of of the moon yeah. the moon to be able to use it for going back on up or or, or you know base you know they're going to be creating a gas station uh in lunar orbit somewhere to be able to yeah. feel at least up at the, uh, the gateway or something like that yeah yeah and just a note to some of my viewers uh when you heard dr walter say leo he meant low earth orbit oh yes yes that means yeah yeah, yeah leo is uh low earth orbit and then there's geo or geosynchronous uh orbit yeah. uh Geosynchronous Earth orbit is our, yes. some people will just say it's the geo from geosynchronous, <laughs> one or the yeah. other. And then I think that there might be some others in there. I think there's like a uh, medium Earth orbit. There might be like a Mio or some, something like that. But yeah. low Earth yeah. orbit pretty much is about, you know, yeah. I think it starts at a little over 100 kilometers up to maybe 500 or something like that. That's pretty much where right. all the satellites are. And then yeah. geo, of course, uh, is where the, you know, t television satellites are up there in communication satellites. Yeah, speaking of communication, that's that's another very important um, factor to consider, right? Because uh, we've spoken mm -hmm. about radio communication and the challenges that it has in really implementing all these programs and projects and how it's just not sufficient. But um, I guess our communication system will also have to change. And, um, yes. There's, there's been some work that's, um, that's going on on this, and NASA also has been at... Uh, Work. Starlink, of course, has been at work. In November, NASA is going to, um, well, demonstrate technology, hopefully, um, that will prove the viability of, of uh, laser-based communication systems between, um, and the satellite network. Starlink already has some version of this uh, up and running uh, in their constellation with, I think, a bunch of their V2 satellites uh, with, um, with laser technology in, on them. It's not something that's out of the realm of possibility. And, and it will be very important. So it, it, it doesn't mean we can communicate faster. It just means we can communicate more data faster. And right. it might simplify power requirements and everything else. So um, if you recall the New Horizons space probe that went out to Pluto, hmm. it was so far out there and it just did a flyby. So remember, it, it wasn't able to park in orbit or anything like that. So it just right. had a few hours that it went past and it took, I think, a couple of years to send the data back because it was wow. it had to yeah. be done at such a slow rate. Because think yeah. about it, that distance, and yeah. it's it's only got a limited power supply, and right. it's it's putting some very faint signal out there that's going to be picked up by these really large antennas back somewhere on, on Earth. Uh, and, and I think the speeds were akin to or maybe worse than dial-up for those of <laughs> us who are old enough to remember the days of dial-up. So um, if you want want to get the kind of speeds that we're used to with the internet, yeah, pretty much the laser will be the only way. The other thing is, mm -hmm. is the laser also become kind of private um, because it's a very right. narrow signal, whereas right. you know radio signals is very broad. Now, right. we we think of lasers being absolutely perfect and collimated, and they just kind of keep that nice. Um, sort of very focused beam the whole way it's like well it still spreads out a little bit over certain yeah. distances but not quite as yeah. much as a, as a radio wave so we can pack a lot more data in there now i can say it's, it's the same thing as the difference between the old coax cable which was pretty much radio frequency going through um the coax cable 
versus fiber optic. And we know fiber optic, you can just put so much more data, the, yeah. the data bandwidth yeah. is something else. So if yeah. we want that, um, it's gonna be very important, not just for communication to the moon, but also when we go out to Mars, and I think one funny thing, this, this, this thing about the moon, moon then, is like if you, then if you go to if, if you go if you go to Mars, wouldn't your lasers have to be a lot more powerful by orders of magnitude? Probably, yeah. probably. There, 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 in there, order, in order be, to keep that beam uh, yeah. stable, yeah, pointed in the right direction. Yeah, and and that's the big thing is like really being able to point it and keep it stable, and that's I think what a lot of these demonstrations have been doing is is showing that we can yeah. have two two satellites and in and, and Earth orbit and be able to shoot a beam from one to the other and actually be able to pick it up. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, so, doing it over so a longer distance, like those... the moon has already been challenged. And then, yeah. you know, it gets harder and harder. Uh, yeah. the, the way I look at it is that anyone that's used to playing um, uh, football, and I don't mean American football, I mean international football, right? And if you want to kick a goal, it's pretty easy to do it from the, the penalty line of only 11 meters out, right? Right, right. Uh, but if you're trying to do it from midfield or from the opposite yeah. one, we know how yeah. hard it is to hit the goal from there. And it's yeah, just that parallax better. problem. The, the further yeah. away you get, the, the, the more precise you have to be, it gets a bit tougher. Now, the beam is probably spreading out a little bit, which might be, yeah. you know, <laughs> make it a little bit easier to hit it. But still, then that means it's attenuating a little bit. But yeah. I'm confident it can be done that, you know, once they kind of know where these things are, they would be able to do some sort of you know, pilot beam or something like that to give you an idea of where it is. And then it focuses in once you get it, it can probably lock in and, and hold that for quite a while. So for the benefit of our viewers, I mean, most people are familiar with, uh, with uh, your transmission towers for signals on Earth. Would you then need uh, a similar system out in space with relay stations along the way? From, I think so. From, I, from Earth I, I to the moon so. and from right. the, and Mars and beyond. Right, right. So now with the moon, I would think we should be able to do it fairly direct. Um, now, what it may come down to is, you know, do we beam it from the moon straight to Earth? Um, or is it something that goes to a satellite in Earth orbit? And then from there, it gets beamed on down. Um, because you're going to have attenuation as you go through the Earth's atmosphere. And I think this is what they're trying to check here is, is whether they are actually able to take the laser and send it directly on down. Now, the problem, of course, is that the Earth is constantly spinning. So yeah. whatever target you're kind of looking for down there keeps it keeps on moving and you've it's got weather target. and all these other different yeah. systems and the yeah. angles are going to change. So it may be easier to have a couple of dedicated satellites that are, let's say, more fixed in the, in the way they orbit that you would just go to there and then let them worry about the details of beaming down. <laughs> To, the kind of to the geosynchronous of the space. Right. So there, there could, and yeah, and there, there may be something not quite geosynchronous, but there may be some other weird thing. Now, one, one could be um, putting these relays at like the Lagrange points. So right. um, these would be like stable points between the Earth and the moon that would just be sitting there like an L1 and you just kind of put it there and then it beams it back and forth very easily. So you kind yeah, of know where yeah. you're pointing in space. But I would think from the moon, it, it's close enough that we should be able to get enough power and we, we can put solar cells as big as we want on the moon to, to come up with something that we can just beam a lot on out there but it's very different with a space probe you know it's like it's limited about how big it can be and the amount of power you'd want to have so that's yeah. just going to be the question is like what you know how much can those relays deal and how they're bouncing around now if you're using a relay that means your communication speed is going to slow down so if you need to get a message somewhere really quickly, going through a relay is not going to be as good as being able to shoot it straight at where you want to go, line of sight yeah. if you can. But I um, mean, think of the power that you'd need to shoot a laser straight from Earth or mm -hmm. or even uh, LEO, low yeah. Earth orbit, straight to Mars. It's crazy amounts of power that you'd need. Yeah. Is that yeah, viable? It, it, well, oh yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're talking about, Coming up with these these lasers to be able to send these solar sails to you know to uh, Proxima Centauri, you know mm -hmm. the the uh, was it the uh, the star shot, uh, and and those are going to be like super ridiculously powerful. So it would be possible, and because it's for communication, um, I think while there's going to be a certain amount of power, it's not going to be that prohibitive to be able to do it. Right. And so I, I would say you'd be able to do it. You do have a certain amount of free energy in space when you put your, your solar panels on out there. So, right. and again, it will depend upon the distance and, and how you're, you're willing to do it. So like a straight shot between Mars and the Earth 
when they're in opposition. And of course, it'd be difficult to do it in opposition because you have to go through the moon or through the sun. <laughs> so when it's a little bit off, that would probably require a lot of power to be able to do that. Um, but if you then start using different relay stations, and again, these would probably be at different Lagrange points in the Earth orbit and also in the Martian orbit as they kind of go around, right. they would right. sort of bounce off of them, which means it'll take a little bit longer for the signal to get there, yeah. but it's taking a long time for the signal to get anywhere anyways. And for the most part, what you're yeah. talking about is not direct communication like we're doing right now. It's more like, oh, I just send an SMS message. And right. it gets there when it gets there because I want to send the person a picture. And they don't need it right now. If they get it in five minutes, it's okay. So the whole idea of it is to be able to take a lot of the data that you're gathering in Mars and then being able to send it back home. At the same time, there's going to be a lot of data from back home that we want to send up, upload to Mars, uh, yeah. a lot of that information. So that means you will have a communication channel, which is probably has high fidelity, really high bandwidth through it. Yeah. And it's going to bounce through these different relays and the relays yeah. will do whatever they do to make sure they're kind of finding the next closest node. So it's going to look yeah. a lot like the internet, except in space. Yeah. You're going to have these nodes where everything is bouncing around. And yeah, it takes, you know, 20, 30 minutes to, to get sent to but finally get there. up there. But you don't really yeah. care. And the, and the opportunity cost is, isn't that high. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and, it is and the, viable. And the main thing is if I just say, look, you know, I, I want to watch the World Series. Okay. Yeah. And so you queue it up and let them know I want to watch the World Series when I'm on Mars. And okay, I'm 30 minutes behind the whole thing. But once that starts streaming, I'm not going to tell the difference, right? It's almost like I'm watching right. a live broadcast. And no one yeah. else on Mars knows the score. Either. Well, unless some sneaky guy was using a radio <laughs> transmitter and he, he get the final score and get, was able to bet ahead of me. But, you know, for the most part, yeah. So once the streaming service is working, it's okay. It's, it's, it's when you want to have the bi-directional communication that's frustrating right. that you have to wait eight right. minutes for a reply or 40 minutes for a reply in the worst case. Yeah. So do you foresee two parallel systems where you have radio-based communication as well as laser-based? Yeah, I, 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 think, each other? I think you would have two that, um, you know, it's potential the laser-based because you're bouncing around, you're taking a really long path to get to where you want to go. It's going to take longer to communicate what could be a very simple message. And if you need to send something that, and you really need to get a response really quickly, you probably would still want to have the uh, the radio frequency, um, which we know works. I mean, we're, we're able to do that right now. It's just that we can't send a whole lot of data. Right. So high fidelity, high bandwidth, how transformational is this going to be when you're looking at NASA's plans for the moon? Uh, oh. And we're talking about deployment of humanoid robots and oh, yeah, far more complex rovers. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it'll be very important to have something like that, especially, you know, if you want to do telerobotic control or you really want to see what it's doing and, and direct it from Earth as opposed, or, you know, it could be that you're directing it from the gateway itself, so you'd be a little bit right. closer. Um, right. So that, that'll be very important to be able to up and download information because who knows how much information they could be gathering at any point if you want to have, you know, the, um, the you want to see exactly what that particular humanoid bot is seeing and you have lots of them. <laughs> Boy, yeah. that's a lot of data you're going to be sending home yeah. to be processed, uh, to look at, to understand the discoveries and everything else that's going on. So yeah. it will be transformational. And the funny thing about the moon is that uh, it was about three years ago, I saw a press release and it was at uh, Nokia. And yes, Nokia still exists, <laughs> um, had won a contract from NASA to build a 4G network on the moon. Yeah. In fact, Nokia has been doing a crazy lot of work on, on networks including 5G and beyond. Yes, yes. Now, now the funny thing was, this is about three years ago, and it was like yeah. a 4G network on the moon. I'm like, on the moon. 4G yeah. is like, first of yeah. all, on the moon, and why aren't they building like a 5 or 6G at that point? And I guess there were some particular reasons why that, uh, I guess 5G, um, well, it's pretty good. I don't think it has quite the same distance as 4G. So if you want to get coverage on the moon, you would go with like a 4G because you wouldn't need to put as many towers up there. And 4G is good enough for the number of astronauts going to have there. But again, right. it, was, it was such a, a weird headline. I didn't believe it was true. And it turned out like the Onion, which is the one that usually comes up with the satirical headlines, they yeah. were kind of surprised. And, and because everyone thought yeah. it was an Onion headline and said, no, it wasn't us. And they had to figure out, well, how do we make it more satirical? And they decided that, oh, what, what they're going to do is they, they've come up with a design for what the towers are going to look like in the moon. They're going to look like pine trees or something like that it's just like it's just so no one will notice the towers you know it's like right okay pine trees that'll work but it's it's really interesting they're thinking of setting up a cellular network actually on the moon 
yeah. um, for the communication, yeah. you know, with rovers, with everything else. And then, of course, that's going to have to have some um, central office, which is going to be beaming something maybe up to the gateway. And, of course, the reason why the gateway is where the gateway is, is to allow yeah. continuous communication between the astronauts uh, and, and using that as a relay station back yeah. to Earth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating. Um, it's I mean, you know, you can't help but smack your lips at uh, <laughs> the potential um, in terms of technology development, but even greater potential economic potential, um, especially if you are lucky enough to be um, a SpaceX investor, or you know, hopefully, a Starlink uh, investor if Elon decides to IPO Starlink. So yeah. therein lies the big question: Does Optimus solve the question of labor in space? Yes, it, it will definitely solve a, a lot of that because it, it will make it more economic to do a lot of things because spacesuits are super expensive. I mean, they're millions of dollars a piece uh, for yeah. those spacesuits and they, they have a limited lifetime. They've got to have these complex cooling systems in there. Uh, you need to obviously have the consumables. Um, one of the things that I w was surprised to find out is that as part of the way the, the cooling system actually works um, on these suits is they use um, a type of um, flash evaporation of the water. So the cooling water that's going through, they actually uh -huh. evaporated somehow. So the Apollo astronauts, okay. a lot of the way that worked is like the water was actually going into, you know, going off into space. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, wow. you know, that's something you don't want to waste. <laughs> but you know that was that was the best way because you get a phase transition and that's the best yeah. way to kind of wick away the excess heat so they were having right. a problem I mean, it, they they got very very hot on the moon so they really need yeah. to have these cooling systems so you have yeah. these complex systems that are not really going to be that much of a problem with optimus Optimus doesn't breathe doesn't need water and you know, there's going to probably be some sort of cooling system you know whether they have to do a, you know again flash evaporation for that i don't know the um and it doesn't need sleep so it, it will be able to work 24 seven. Whereas the astronauts, they said that the amount of energy that they expended on any of the EVAs was like equivalent to running a marathon. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. And, and, and they're fighting against a lot of things, you know, they still haven't come up with the best pressure suits yet, but basically, yeah. you know, it's like you fill that thing out, you're going to be like that. So you're kind yeah. of fighting against the pressure of that the whole time, as well as, you know, having to wear these gloves, which make it very difficult for you to do anything. So, yeah. So yeah. They're, they're very inflexible. Yeah. And let's not forget the impact of gravity on the human skeletal system and musculoskeletal mm. system. Yes. The, the amount of muscle mass that you lose over time in space is, is crazy. It's, it's, it's absolutely. And, and we, the thing is, we don't know how the human body is going to react to long term on one six gravity. We have yeah. only two data points, really zero gravity and earth gravity. And yeah. the amount of data that we have in one six, we can't make any conclusions from that. They've tried to do some simple tests in the International Space Station with uh, using the centrifuges and mice to get an idea of, you know, what are, we know there are health problems at zero G. We just don't yeah. know where they go away. Do they go away at it's one six G, one third G, half G, yeah. Venusian yeah. gravity, which is going to yeah. be like, you know, 85% or something like yeah. that. You know, where is it that all these problems go away? It yeah. seems like they know that from these experiments on mice that a few things go away at one six gravity but they think there's still some other issues that you're going to have with long-term exposure. So it won't be quite yeah. as bad as being in the International Space Station, um, yeah. but it's going to be there. And another thing is, is I, I had the opportunity to actually uh, talk to a couple of astronauts that were in the International Space Station. Yeah. And, you know, they have to work out two hours a day. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was like... And it's mostly it was, resistance workouts. It's resistance training. And they were complaining yeah. the resistance training. Um, um, uh, Doug Hurley's wife is also an astronaut, <laughs> mm. and um, you know she she had to have a, a hip joint replaced, and you know part of it she she oh, just felt right. uh, it was that treadmill that was up there was right. not the best because it was like having a sack of potatoes or more on your back and running with that, right. and so there's yeah. kind of that pounding that put a little bit of air. So they needed to do something like that to, because there was no gravity and you needed something. Yeah, yeah. But the feeling was that you needed to have a better design. So. Sometimes our countermeasures are also causing long-term problems that people yeah. are not aware of um, because it's just difficult to, um, you know, come up with what's the best way. You know, are we going to end up having 
a centrifuge where we're spinning everyone around to, to give yeah. them that that's going to be required. But hopefully one six things won't be quite as bad. Um, and it, it, it ought to be better on Mars, given how yes, closer yes. to Earth's gravity mass. Yes, mass, it, gravity it, mass. It'll, it'll be better. We just, but that's the thing. We just don't know. And the irony is they said that if, you know, every NASA experiment has an acronym. And, and this thing that they have on the International Space Station, which was like a little centrifuge, um, right. was called MARS, so, and, and, you know, <laughs> M-A-R-S, yeah. to be able to simulate gravity. And, you know, they had these controlled mice down on Earth and stuff like that. They even had some of them up there that were being spun around at Earth Gs to compare them with the ones on the Earth to see if they're all right. And the other gravity that they used was one-sixth gravity. But they didn't do one-third gravity. I'm like, what? You, you're in this whole experiment, and it's called Mars, and you didn't use Martian gravity? What's going on? <laughs> I don't quite understand this. But I guess it's because they're, they're looking at, you know, lunar gravity at first to be yeah, more yeah. important. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's ironic that it's the lunar gravity that's big. Uh, I mean, despite being closer to us, is the biggest challenge. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and and the yeah. fact that, you know, the Dioner cycle up there is not the same, you know, it's it's two weeks yeah. day, two, you know, two weeks to, night. And, yeah. you know, uh, but it's only three days away. And so that, that makes it a lot easier. The trip to Mars is going to be tough because you, you're looking at, yeah. you know, six months in the best case, but, you know, close, closer yeah. to eight or nine months to get there yeah. the closest, and doing yeah. what ever to mitigate and eight months of weightlessness is is a lot i mean they, they found the international space station now that's pretty tough and then you get there and now when they came back to earth um they said they were recovered pretty quickly that you know at first it was pretty it wasn't that bad the second time for a lot of these these astronauts that had been up there they said the second time was a lot easier than the first time so maybe that whoever they send to mars is like oh you, you got to spend a couple of months in low earth orbit and find out what it's like and come back and yeah. just just so you kind of know when you go there but you and the question is whether yeah, you'll, one you'll it, suffer it, a little bit of atrophy but that's about it you get back yeah on, you, you get back and the, the thing space. is it's like okay we got one third so it's gonna be easier to adapt to one third but at the same yeah. time is one third not going to give us enough to kind of recover everything that we lost along the way right right yeah it's fascinating so so if tesla becomes the uh monopoly uh, or has the monopoly secures the monopoly in in, uh, in the space labor market what sort of it boggles the mind but what sort of economics are we talking about oh i mean it, it, it's crazy because the, the first thing they're going to be doing is they're going to be dominating it down here yeah and and learning from that and then being able to take that up into space uh which then just makes space affordable for everyone i mean just just yeah. imagine all the things that can be done up there where you don't have to send people up there at first to be able to develop some sort of infrastructure that now makes it very easy for people to go up. And especially with the, the, the cost of going into orbit is going to be going down quite a bit. Yeah. It's not yeah. just that SpaceX is looking at, there's a lot of other companies out there yeah. that also are, right. are are thinking of doing as well. And so I'm sure the competition is going to heat up. There's going to be people yeah. that are going to come up with some novel designs that are are going to be a bit better than what SpaceX has. And then SpaceX is going to look at that and say, hey, you know, we got to come up with something a little bit better ourselves. So, yeah, yeah I'm seeing that. Yeah, competition is, is always great. Yeah. And I think oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely great. Possible. And and again, it's like, man, I'm really jealous of my kids because of, of the, the world they're going to get to see. And I'm just like, man, I hope I can hang yeah. on long enough to, to see some of this stuff. <laughs> but I've, I've made my daughter promise me that she'd bury me on Mars. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah, okay. Which, which she has gleefully accepted. Oh, okay. Okay. That's, you know, and, uh, and I mean, it, we've, we've already seen something like that. I know they're temporary, but um, there are some people who've been able to be cremated and have their, their ashes brought into space into yeah. orbit. But then I think they were required by treaty and other things that have to come back on down. So at least yeah. they, they were kind of up there. And as remember James Duhan, who was um, played Scotty on Star Trek, his right. ashes were, were actually sent into orbit. Yeah. 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 Uh, Scotty was beamed up. Yep, almost, he was. Almost, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, another aspect of um, of the high fidelity, high bandwidth um, pr pr proposition is the ability to upload a new function or a new training module to a humanoid robot remotely from here on Earth or low Earth orbit or the gateway. How, how much of a multiply effect will that have? Oh, I think that, that'll be very important. Um, you know, just knowing that the updates I get, like with uh, my Tesla FSD, and 
it doesn't, it seems like the amount of data you need to send is not that much. Hmm. Um, it downloads, you know, it takes a little while to download, but it's not that bad over normal Wi-Fi. So right. it would be very easy to, to get these uh, updates to the bots. And certainly there's going to be, you know, just like what we do with FSD, there's always going to be, oh, you know, we had a little bit of a problem at this intersection or something like that. You re report that. And then the next release hopefully is able to take that into its training set. So you can just imagine the bots are going to be out there and encountering some really interesting things. And that's going to be sent back. And then they will be retrained on it. And then over the air update. Um, well, over the vacuum update, I guess, would be more yeah. appropriate. Did we just coin that? Okay, there we go. Over the vacuum. There we go. Over the vacuum updates. Yeah. I think that should stick. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, and OTV. Yep. There we go. An OTV. <laughs> All right, and here's my bonus question for you, <laughs> Dr. Walter. So where does you see Optimus first, in our households here on Earth or in space? Uh, actually, I, I think we will probably see it in our households first. And the main reason I, I say that is that um, it just seems like it's taking us a little bit longer to get up there. Than, you know, I, I don't know how soon before we really have a, a base in the moon. You know, it's... Everyone's hoping, oh, we should be able to do it in, in five years. Artemis is going to land in, what was it, 2026? And even then, I'm like, mm, yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll I guess, see. I guess it's, it's, it's down to the bureaucrats in America, right? Right. How it comes down. How soon can they allow Starship to fly? <laughs> right. First that, get, getting that. And then, you know, the first couple of missions are just more or less about boots and flags. And, you know, when are they going to actually be putting any sort of infrastructure? So it's really not going to be until the 2030s that you start to see any real serious infrastructure being built there. And I would think by the 2030s, you would uh, already be seeing uh, humanoid bots uh, appearing in, in the households around that time. And, uh, you know, I, I saw that you had a, a pretty good um, discussion yesterday, I think with uh, yeah. Brad Adcock, that, who is um, the, the CEO of, um, of Figure. Figure, which is yeah. uh, another, uh, they've been around 18 months and uh, also announced a humanoid robot and, and yeah. have their, it's kind of their first designs out there. And I think just by the end of the decade, you know, would, would be when you begin to see the first ones in the house. And of course he was like, not exactly being sanguine. He's like, oh, he's out, you know, we don't have any data. It's going to take a long time. You know, it's like, won't be till the end of the decade. Well, I'm looking around, I was like, Hmm, it's almost end of 2023. End of the decade's not that far off. I mean, depending on how you look yeah. at it, it's five yeah. or six years or seven years. You know, yeah. cons consider 2030 yeah. to actually be part of yeah. this decade and not the next and, one. And that too, at the, at, that's at the current rate of development. That's at that's at the current rate, and and I think um, it it will happen really quick because what everyone is is saying is like, oh, we don't have any data sets. The problem is just like yeah. this dearth of data sets. Like, well, yeah, we had problems like that going back in in the early 2000s with. Uh, these these others that that we were trying to use these large language models with, and eventually they got to figure it out. So what's going to happen is that people are going to be developing these very large data sets very quickly, and you'll start to get those um, those neural nets that they can begin to build on. Because their complaints like, well, yeah, we can train these things really fast, but you just can't start blank. If we get something that's already kind of partially filled in, then we can start going really really quickly. And so. Uh, doing a lot of simulations and everything else will help speed that up. Getting real world training data will help speed those things up. And if he thinks it's like, oh, you know, until 2030, that's not that far away that you yeah. begin to see it. And and that means that they are getting very, very smart at that point. Because I, I really yeah. agree with what he kind of talked about. It's like, you're not going to see it in the houses right away because yeah. um, it's so unstructured in there. We just don't know what we're really going to expect within factories it's all very structured and it makes sense there. The total addressable market in the factories is so huge anyways, who cares about yeah. the home market? There are people yeah. that would be willing to pay for that. And we know it's controlled, we know it's structured, we can get the training data. And then once we get the training data from that, it'll go in there. And this is gonna be, it's very good, which means that it's something that's just gonna start paying for itself very, 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 yeah. very quickly. It's yeah. not gonna be the company is gonna be putting billions and billions and billions of dollars and nothing coming out. It's gonna be yeah. that, once you start putting it in the factories and that robot starts being productive, yeah, it's paying for itself right there, yeah. which th then allows you to bootstrap and do a little bit more. Yeah, and I suspect UAW will have um, given Optimus quite a quite a shot in the arm with the strike, and I guess a lot of auto automakers in the U.S. would be looking at the potential of deploying Optimus on the factory floors. Yes. 
Yes, and and there are a a lot of low hanging fruit, as you probably know. That's a term I use a lot. Of yeah. the, these tasks that are, are very very simple to do, um, yeah. with sort of the, the current optimist could easily do it, and the others yeah. that are out there. So mechanically, they're pretty close. They may not be quite as fast as a human, but they're getting there. And as far as intelligence that's needed, they don't really need a whole lot of sophistication or you know extreme dexterity. It's a very simple kind of task. So I'm pretty sure we're going to be seeing those already next year. Yeah, uh, that Tesla will probably be announcing at some point. So oh, see, here we go. You know, they've yeah, already done yeah. a couple of shifts. Yeah, and in fact, on on this over the horizon podcast of mine, I like to look at the intersection of technology um, and the future of work and social uh, and you know social trends. Um, and I, I I would love an opportunity to to discuss the implications of Optimus in the light of the UAW strike and what it means and what it possibly could be. So if you're game, I'd love to do that. Oh yeah, time. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I can give you sort of like a really quick overview of, of, of sort of what you see going on Please. and why it's important is that uh, we are having a demographic shift right now where um, with the retirement of a lot of people, there is our job shortages. So there's a label shortage for a, a, a lot of uh, things. Um, truck driving is one. Um, you also have like lack of welders and you can go down and all sorts of other sort of skills that you, you don't have, you know, how many people really want to be a roofer yet. There's like demand for, for people putting roofs on houses all over the place. And a lot, of, you know, here in Florida, whenever we have a, a hurricane, a lot of times, you know, houses are covered up with a blue tarp for like one or two years while they wait to find a roofer that's able to come in and do it. So there's a lot of ways of solving some of those problems. Uh, you know, one with the truck drivers is not to have Optimus driving, but we're going to have these vehicles that are autonomous that are really kind of dedicated for something like that. Um, and then, you know, other tasks like, you know, roofing is going to be a humanoid type of, of robot or any sort of, of building activities. Welding, well, we already kind of have a solution there in that there are these robots that are spe specifically designed. They're not humanoid of form, but they're able to do yeah, it. They don't need to be. Yeah. However, they can only handle about 95% of the welding situation. There are some situations that they just can't get in there. And sometimes a human with a, with a torch can actually go in and do the job. So there will still be some humanoid applications for welding and a lot of these other kinds of things. So we're seeing right. these labor shortages in there. And again, it's like agriculture, boy, you know, talk about low hanging fruit there. That 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 is one of those that for years, they've been trying to figure out how to automate it because it's very difficult. And it's not like people really want to go out and and work in the fields all day it's, it's extremely difficult and and you know you take anyone that says oh it, you know it's not that hard and you put them out there for a day or two and they were like yeah that's not a job that's not a career that you'd want to do so eventually there's going to be a lot of these jobs that really are are really the robots should be doing and, and that's sort of what elon has been talking about is that yeah, it's meant for the jobs that are uh, monotonous, you know, tedious, yeah. and dangerous, and it's going to be filling a lot of those things. And it's not going to be that it's necessarily saying you can't work anymore. It's like work if you want. I mean, if you if yeah, you want sure. like it, but make sure it's a job you really like. You know, you're not doing it because yeah. you've got no choice right now. Yeah. But it's something that you want to do to while away the hours, or just, you, you get some excitement about it. Um, yeah. But we should be able to find a lot of these these jobs that people don't want. And again, turnover, there's a lot of jobs where the, the turnover and absenteeism is a problem. This is one of the things that the big three were talking about in their discussions is that they were having a problem with absenteeism. And that means we're getting ready to run up the factory and we're looking around and it's like, wait a minute, a bunch of people didn't show up today. What's going on? And we yeah. got to get this thing running because it's costing us money if, yeah. if we slow down the production rate. So that's something that uh, an Optimus robot would be able to make sure is not an issue in the, in the future. Yeah, Elon, if you're listening in, get those bots on the floor already. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. They're oh, probably yes. close. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Well, Dr. Walter, this has been absolutely fantastic. It's been such a pleasure having you on the Over the Horizon podcast. Thank you so much for sparing the time. And I'm, okay, uh, I'm so put up your Twitter page up here. So for those of you watching please do subscribe to dr scott walter on twitter he's at going ballistic five check out his uh, his timeline he has some uh, great discussions also with john uh on um, dr know it all that's another channel 
on YouTube that I personally follow uh, very closely and have learned a lot from uh, the discussions that the two of you all have had on the on that in my regards to John. And I I look forward to doing this again soon. There's so much to talk about. Same here. Same here. I look forward to, to the next installment. All right. Thank you.